start that, let's uh, bring this message before the Lord. Our precious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for uh, the God that you are, that you love us. And Father, uh, as I bring uh, what you've shown me to bring before uh, the body of believers here, is to ask that you would give me the right words to say, that it would be done in a loving way, and Father, that uh, you would cause your word to go forth and do what you want it to. And Father, we just uh, want to thank you so much for the word that you gave us, that we can read it, that we can study it, and we can grow more and more like your son Jesus. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to stand as I read the, the scripture... So this is, uh, again, out of Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 11. And it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy sat before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best for them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And let's pray about that. Father, thank you for this word in Hebrews, and just ask that you would uh, guide us through it. And Father, we just thank you that... uh, uh, your, your servant Paul wrote these things so that we would know more how you want us to live. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm sorry I didn't make any little pieces of paper for you to write down on, but if you have something to write down, I'll try to hit the, the headlines uh, for each section. And you can write that down if you want, and maybe it'll uh, make a little more sense as we go through this. Uh, Hebrews 12 is an interesting uh, book, a chapter uh, from from Hebrews. And uh, one of the things uh, it starts out with is, it says, uh, therefore. And so uh, we've all heard the word, if you have therefore, we need to know what it's there for. And uh, so we really need to look back at uh, chapter 11, and it's, talks, it's the faith chapter, and it's, uh, it's pretty deep. Uh, I'm not going to read all of the verses in uh, chapter 11, but there's a few of them that I wanted to, to read just so that uh, we get a little better understanding of what we're going into as we head into chapter 12. Let's take a quick look then, and uh, it says in verse 1 of chapter 11, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things 
not seen. For by it the men of old gained, gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds we prepare, were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. In verse 6 it says, it has kind of an exclamation point to that, it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. That's always been a, one of my favorite verses. You know, it really tells us what we need to do. We need to seek him. And, uh, and by that, God rewards us. And sometimes we think it's uh, rewarding for, you know, more money here on earth and things like that. But he rewards us with, things that are more meaningful than that. It's the joy that we, we can get by knowing Christ. And so, and there's many other things uh, as we go through uh, the Bible. We, we learn more and more about uh, God's loving kindness, his mercy, and uh, his mercy endures forever. And uh, there's so many things that we see, and those are rewards that we get by knowing and seeking after Christ. Uh, one of the other verses that I'd like to hit in chapter 11 is uh, verse 24. And it says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather the, uh, to endure the ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the approach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Moses is one of the great examples of the, of the faith of all the people that it talks about in, in, in chapter 11. And the writer really wants to encourage his readers, which could be considered us too, with the examples of, of faithful believers and challenge them and us to take heart and to continue walking with God as the old faithful testament saints did. There are great examples in chapter 11, and I would encourage you to read it sometime this week to get a better picture of those who are called witnesses in our study of chapter 12. The next heading I'm going to kind of hit on is the cloud of witnesses. And as we begin to look at the passages for today, I'd like to, for us to think about the people in our lives and the examples that they had for us. Some may be your parents, some may, may be family members, friends, or co-workers who have been faithful in their walk with God. And uh, I'm going to kind of highlight Jim and Carolyn this morning. Jim isn't here, but uh, if we look at Jim and Karen's life, we can see that the faith that they uh, continue to show is, uh, if we look at their life, you know, they left the mission field, they came back home, they didn't seek uh, the, the life of pleasure and the pursuit of happiness like the world does. They came back, here and they continued to be ministering, you know, really to us here in this church, and uh, just just wanting God to continue to work in and through them. And uh, it's easy to look at how the world would look at that. Like, why would you do that? I mean, you you know, you were tired. You're you're coming back home. Hey, just go. Just have a great time. Finish your life out like that. But. That's not what faithful people do. And so, uh, I, you know, that's a great example uh, from them. I also have a friend. I mean, there's many people, but I have a friend back in Renton. And I've known him, you know, pretty much since I was a teenager. And uh, when he came back from college and, you know, came to uh, Renton, you know, in his early 20s, he started teaching Sunday school at the church that Debbie and I attended. And, uh, you know, I think he was probably 24 at the time, 
But he's 71 today. Not today, but he's 71 now. And uh, he's still teaching Sunday school. And here a couple weeks ago, I asked him, well, how much longer are you going to keep teaching Sunday school? And he, he, he didn't have an answer because he loves sharing God's word. And, you know, his wife was sitting there next to him, and she looked at me and she said, he's going to be doing that until his last days on earth because he loves us so much. And, and those are great examples uh, of people who love the Lord and want to not end their life, you know, at, by retirement or because, you know, he's obviously retired too. But, you know, there's, a, there's something greater for us. And so we all need to remember and remember that. And I think of my mom, you know, she'll be 90 here in another month. And uh, her testimony is something that's been good for me because she continues to just uh, want to encourage, you know, all her kids and the people that she comes in contact with to know and love the Lord. And that's really what we should do. The next little heading is uh, laying aside every encumbrance. And so uh, if you look at the, the verses there, what is an encumbrance? We're supposed to lay it aside, but what is it? And uh, I always kind of want to think about uh, when I think of that is, you know, the, the people back in the, in the days when they were traveling west in the United States. And many of them were, you know, coming across in wagons. They put all their belongings on that thing, and they get to the mountains, and they go, you know, they said, hey, we've got we to gotta start getting rid of this stuff. They didn't want to because those things that they probably had you know, heirlooms from their families and different things like that. But they had to if they were going to make that trip, or else they'd turn around and go back. And I think of that, you know, kind of like an encumbrance for us, you know. What does our encumbrance look like? Uh, you know, are there things in our, in our life that we need to throw off, to lay aside so that we can be effective for, for the Lord? Now, all encumbrances, I wouldn't say are, are hindrances, but we really need to stop and think about it. You know, and I wrote down a couple of things. You know, one is spending maybe too much time on social media. I'm guilty. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, I, 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 I thrive on football. I really, you know, enjoy it. So I get on, you know, my phone and I start looking up all the different players on the Huskies because that's kind of the team I, I follow. But I can, you know, stop and, and after an hour and a half looking, at, I've, you know, I spend an hour and a half and it seems like it goes by like that. And, uh, you know, I told Debbie, I've got to cut back because, you know, there's far better things for me to be doing. Uh, if I had spent that same time reading God's word, we know that's beneficial, right? Uh, if we look at 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, I know my cell phone has a lot of good information on it, but it doesn't have that kind of information where God can use us and help us to grow. So I ask you a question. Do you want to be adequate and equipped for every good work? Then we need to be reading God's word. It's important. We need to do that because it's inspired by God. The next heading is, and the sin that so easily entangles us. Oh, I think we all know this one, right? Sin is easy. You know, it's easy to allow it to hinder our relationship with God, and it also, uh, and also that, you know, it hinders us being effective for him. And I'm not going to say a whole lot about that, except for we need to confess it to God. The next section is, uh, let us run with endurance. 
The saints of chapter 11 faced many challenges, trials, and temptations. They may have stumbled, but they got back up and continued to finish the race. The race that we're in is a marathon. And it's not a sprint, it's a daily walk with God. If we look at Paul's letter to the Colossians, we'll see that the desire Paul had that they walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and grow in the knowledge of God. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints and light. And again in Romans, we'll see that God gives the, perse the perseverance and encouragement that we need to finish the race so that together we can, with one voice, glorify God. Romans 15, 5. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Jesus Christ so that with one accord you may with one voice Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, how can we get the endurance we need to run the race that we're in? How can we be triumphant as we uh, face different trials? The next heading is fixing our eyes on Jesus. Verse tells, 2 tells us that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, and that's the answer. Sometimes we try to do it on our own, and then we wonder why it's so hard to follow Jesus and live a life that honors him. In archery, when the archer is trying to hit a target, you know, he has, you know, pulls, pulls it back, but he, he can't be looking off in different directions. He's really got to focus at the center of that target in order to try to hit it. And the same with a catcher, you know, in baseball. When a, a you know a pitcher in baseball, when he's throwing it to the catcher, you know he's got to focus on the, the catcher's mitt, and even some have said they need to try to focus on a point inside that mitt so that they can hit the spot that they're trying to. And uh, so, what does it mean to uh, fix our eyes on Jesus? It really comes down to allowing Jesus to have his place on the throne of our lives and wanting all we do to be for his glory. When we do this, fixing our eyes on Jesus is what we want to do because we understand he wants the best for us and is there helping us in our daily life. And the next section for the heading is Jesus is our example. And as we continue on verse 2, it says Jesus is the author and protector, perfecter of faith. Jesus is our example. He endured the cross, despising the shame. In verse 3, Paul tells us to consider what Jesus endured and not grow weary and lose heart. In verse 4, the, the Hebrew believers had not yet, yet resisted to the point of death and of shedding blood. They had not been martyred like many of the saints from chapter 11. If the faith of the saints in chapter 11 were able to endure to the end, some giving their lives for their faith, then the Hebrew believers could, and we could too. Jesus went through the worst possible torture and death because he loved us. And that should mean something to us. It should make us want to run the, with endurance the race that is set before us. 
This next section is uh, considered, uh, the headline is God Disciplines Us. And uh, this is the part of this chapter. It's not always easy to talk about because, you know, we don't like to be disciplined, right? You know, uh, as we raise kids and, or, you know, think back when you were a kid, the discipline part was no fun. But it ha it's in the Bible, and uh, there's a good reason for it, and so we're going to study that. So if we look at verse 5 in, in our study, it says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. And this next little section here that is highlighted in your Bibles is from Proverbs 3, 4, or 11 and 12. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. And there's a good verse that kind of goes along with this topic in the book of Job. And we know, you know, the book of Job has a lot of, you know, things talks about the trials that he went through but he stayed he stayed the course that God put him on so let's take a look and see what that says in Job 5:17 it says behold how happy is the man whom God reproves so do not despise the discipline of the almighty and in verse 7 in our study it says it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? The main focus of this passage is not discipline our children. But it does imply that all parents should do this. The Hebrews at the time of this writing knew that to raise respectful children, they needed to use discipline. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He who withholds the rod hates his son, but he who loves him dis disciplines him diligently. And I looked up the word diligently because I wanted a little bit better understanding of what it means, and it's, it's a, a, the opposite of being lazy. So, you know, a parent not being lazy when they're disciplining their kids and trying to train them and teach them. It's persevering and doing it with great care. And I like that. I like the way that says, you know, sometimes we think discipline's only the rod, but that's uh, not necessarily the case. You know, there's a training portion of that, and it all should be done in love. Isn't that how God disciplines us? Verse 8 says, But if you are without discipline of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. And it's pretty clear here that we should, should expect to be disciplined by God since we are a child of his. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. When our fathers disciplined us, we recognized their authority and understood that they did it to correct us and to guide us in the way we should go. And we probably recognize that a lot more today because back then we didn't think that it was really training us, but uh, we can look at the benefits of it today. Verse 9, the, first, uh, the second part of 9 says, Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? And we have the benefit of seeing how the discipline from our parents helped us grow to be responsible adults. And doesn't the discipline from God show us his desire for us to be holy as he is and to accept it knowing that we are being conformed into the image of his son? Verse 10 says, For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. That's the parents. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. Verse 11, all scripture for the moment seems to be joyful, 
not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful, peaceful fruit of righteousness. The believers in the book of Hebrews evidently forgot about the importance of being disciplined by God. They, have, they may have been get, began thinking, like some people today, that belief in God would guarantee a life of health, wealth, and happiness. But when we're disciplined, it causes us to focus on God's love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And I want to jump back and look at verse 6 for a second. It says, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And we see here that the motivation for the discipline is love. It's not that God loves to discipline us, but he does it because he loves us and wants to train us. And as parents, we train our children sometimes by letting them make mistakes so that they will grow to be responsible adults. We use discipline to guide them so that they will be safe and know that we love them. And looking back on my life, and I was definitely uh, disciplined by my parents. (laughs) And at the time, I didn't like it, but believe me. I remember one time my mom told me to go get a switch. And I went and got this stick that was real brittle and would break. And she swung that, and it broke. And uh, she said, okay, I'm going to go get one. (laughs) And uh, it it meant something to me. You can't dodge the bullet, right? You got to do it. And so uh, I look back, but it's, uh, you know, I look back on it now. Had my parents not disciplined me, like God was directing them to, I don't know where I'd be here today. I may not be here. Who knows where I'd be? But God had a purpose, and it was using my parents to discipline me. One thing we need to do is we need to uh, pay special attention to the words where it says, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Now, we shouldn't just skip over that part. Uh, because it's really important for us to, to understand it. We really need to pay attention to be his, uh, we really need to pay attention and to his discipline of us. In Proverbs 6.23, it says, For this command is a lamp, this teaching is light, and correction and instruction are the way to life. Proverbs 12.1 says, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. It's kind of a harsh word, but that's what it said. Proverbs 13.1 says, A wise son accept his fa- accepts his father discipline, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. And that's someone who, is, who mocks or ridicules, and so that's uh, not good. These verses are focusing on parental discipline, but God uses our parents to guide us through those. So, what should we do when we're disciplined by God? We should recognize that God loves us because we're his sons and daughters, and he wants us to share in his holiness. As we close, I'd like to ask you how chapter 12 in Hebrews challenges you to run the race that's before you, as it says in those first two verses of of chapter 12. How do we apply this to our daily walk with him? Are we going to grow weary and lose heart, telling ourselves we can't do it? It's too much for me? Or are we going to put our trust in God Understanding that his discipline is building our faith, helping us love him more, knowing that he first loved us and sent his son Jesus to show us how much he loves us. And we're going to close in a word of prayer. Who want to stand? We're not leaving yet, but we're going to close this section in a word of prayer. 
Our precious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word and for the discipline that it shows us on how you love us. And Father, just ask that you would be, be with each one of us, that we would be listening to the prompting of your Holy Spirit on the things that maybe we're not doing right, and that we would get that right, and that you would help us, Father. Just give us strength. Help us to be a light shining for you in darkness. And Father, as we minister here in this community of Mattawa, we ask that you would be with this church, the body of believers here, and the other churches that proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, that we would be a, an impact in this community for you, and that, that we would begin to see many people coming to know you as their personal Savior. Father, thank you for this, and we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.